Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Joseph S. Samiego, the author of the Carolingian Age book series. And I am back with another reaction video. This one is Metatron's Knights Were Filthy Rich. And we have discussed this uh, to some extent in previous vi videos about the budget practices of knights to, to a small extent. Um, because some of their things some of their world was expensive. We think about inflation and and you look at prices at um, for cosplaying or, or for LARPing and you look at those prices and you think, wow, that's, that's expensive. It's a couple hundred dollars for this and several hundred dollars for that or several thousand for this. And let's look at what it really was. Uh, I think we might be... I think some people might be surprised by by some of the numbers he. I'm sure he's going to give out. I have not actually watched this. Um... So let's let's check it out. Knights were filthy rich. Now, of course, there were the exceptions. Okay, so uh, obviously, when we consider the knightly class throughout the entirety of the Middle Ages, yes, there probably were some knights who, for some reasons, fell and into bankrupt and didn't have much money. But this would be the exception. The yeah. So a lot of people know from george R. R. martin's work there's something called hedge knights there was uh something like this in history uh, i don't believe they were called hedge knights the the whole idea of hedge knights is that they're poor so they're sleeping in the hedges but they're still called sirs they're still knights uh we do know that in history they would travel tournament to tournament or they would sell themselves to to people to be retainers um he painted them as more or less poor knights they those were probably more your richer knights if they were able to enter the tournaments and, and make a name for themselves and win. Uh, but yeah, there were knights because people spend, spent their money lavishly. Uh, wars cost money. And if you came out as the loser, it cost you even more money. So yeah, there were. Uh, it was a gamble. It, it, being a knight in, in those days was a gamble. The majority of knights, they were rich. And I'm not talking wealthy. I'm saying they had a lot of money. It's sometimes... If he's not talking wealthy, but it, then he's saying they have a lot of money, what is... I mean, that's... I, I don't know. The, in my eyes, that's the only way they would have measured wealth because I don't think they would have... Uh, if you look at a lot of, a lot of the uh, journals and letters that have been kept over the years... A lot of knights and a lot of noblemen didn't really measure their <laughs> who they had as their friends as, as terms of wealth. I'm to the point that we can't even comprehend it. Now, for example, um, let's have a look at the late 15th century, one of those beautiful full plate harnesses that I have recently made a video about, if you're interested, on, on who can make good full plate harnesses and, and, and armor for you. Um, link in the description below. But if we look at these, well, one of the things is that when you see a historical reenactment in our day and age, and quite a lot of people actually ask, you know, like, well, that's an amazing sort of armor you've got there. Of course, I don't, but I'm just saying people say uh, when they see pictures for example and then they often ask how much is that and when you talk about prices so you say well 15th century full plate armor can range from eleven thousand dollars to thirty thousand dollars to get the proper set made and um, tailored for you then a lot of people are like wow that's okay so he's talking about a modern day recreation i'm guessing functional and, and the price probably ranges depending on functionality of a fifth century armor between eleven and thirty thousand dollars that is insane and I, I know that there's people who pay for that because it's part of their livelihood um, and more power to them but wow that is a lot of money in, in today's world I mean that's like a car think about it it's it's a it's a decent used car or even a decent new car in US dollars. Crazy, it's super expensive and yes, given it is an expensive hobby, isn't it? But then some people ask, they're like, it did happen to me, they're like, well, so knights had so much money to spend? 
And that is when the situation gets interesting. Now, actually, that price for a night would have been like super cheap, like easy, not a problem. You're going to make a full suit of armor for the equivalent in medieval currency of $30,000. No problem. Okay, mate, um, I, mate, can you bring my change, please? No, really. Here's the thing. Um, this price is considering modern technology. So, modern technology, the availability of steel, the availability of materials, and all the different things that allow us to make these amazing suits of armor, um, has decreased the price exp exponentially. So this is an actually amazing cheap price that at the time wouldn't have been possible because full plate armor, it's amazing, I love it, but now it's like super old technology, isn't it? I mean, we are talking like five centuries old, but for the night, it would have been the equivalent of modern day stealth technology in airplane, okay? The, um okay, so before we go further, um, <clears throat> yeah, so we got to think about uh, in a lot of ways. This was craftsmanship that was done by hand uh, for armor and chain mail, uh, leather tannin, everything. Um, hammering it out, it was done by hand. So yeah, with today's technology, we can do it quicker. We have laser cut machines that can cut the sh cut the sheet metal, um, that, which is probably what they're using, some kind of steel sheet metal. And you got to also think that you had to make steel. Steel is not something that you just go over into the mine and, and mine out a clump of steel. No, what you're doing is you're actually creating steel from from other components, iron and carbon. and It's just like um, when you create bronze from tin and copper. It's not this um, one mineral. It's, it's a composite of minerals that combined. And obviously the better the quality of the, the initial ingredients are, the better quality of steel is, which means the harder it is to make and the more expensive it is so yeah it, it makes sense that that our prices are lower american stealth planes and that sort of stuff it was the best technology could provide for war as far as defensive equipment is concerned the very best so when we talk about a really good 15th century foot uh, full plate armor the prices range from and i didn't make up this pr this uh, this price okay i am actually citing uh, quoting sorry i'm quoting dr capwell tobias capwell and yes He's badass, okay? If you think I know history, well, I'm, I'm nothing compared to that guy when talking about armor and battles in general. He is a real amazing expert. Now, the number he came up with is that he estimated that a full 15th century full, uh, full plate armor would cost uh, the equivalent in dollars of between $500,000 to $3.5 million. Where is the armor that can get me the armor for 30,000 again? So this is what I mean. Imagine a knight who is going to war and he needs to purchase a full suit of armor and he spends, well, $1 million, the equivalent of $1 million, of course, in his own currency. How much money does he have to be able to do that? But, but if you think about it, I mean, knights, they had castles. How much money can a castle cost, okay? And never mind the big villas and mansions that some people live in. I mean, a castle built with medieval technology, it's incredible. And, you know, it's... And you can understand, you can start understanding um, through military history the enormous gap that you had between the nobility, the royalty, for example, and the common people. So knights were expensive also to deploy, and this also helps us understand why, if we look at the Battle of Agincourt, for example, uh, one of my favorite battles uh, t as far as the 14th century is concerned, um, if we look at the Battle of Agincourt, for example, we can start understanding why Henry V uh, deployed so many archers. Um, and the reason it's not just because, well, longbow men, they are really cool, in fact, he, he won the battle because he slaughtered the French, and so he deployed them because they were effective. But no, it's not just that. A longbowman is much cheaper than a man at arm and considerably cheaper to deploy than a, a knight. They were not cheap, I'd like to underline, they were just cheaper. So with the same money, you could deploy more men. Yeah, and longbowmen uh, were skilled. So it wasn't that they were just uh, conscripts from that you're pulling out of villages and stuff. These were skilled and trained archers. A longbow 
uh, had like an 80 or 100 pound drawstring, so you had to have practice with it. It wasn't something that that anybody could just pick up a bow and go out there and do. Um, you had to have some skill with it to be able to do it and do it well. So yeah, they they were cheaper because you because of the fact that uh, you didn't have to arm them as much. But arrows were not necessarily cheap. Arrows still themselves were. One arrow was typically, uh, I'm actually looking at price lists here from the 15th century. And if I'm reading this correctly, uh, it looks like one arrow would have been the equivalent of just a basic arrow. looks like it would be the equivalent of a dozen 15 pences. 15 pences, so a shilling. Let's say a shilling. It looks like it's what they converted to. Which was the same way, which was actually uh, three days wages for a mason. So a dozen arrows, a dozen basic arrows was the same as three days. Wait, actually it was three pences more. It was basically four days wages for a mason in the 15th century. Um, or around, around the 15th century. So yeah, that's it's definitely... Um, you definitely had to have a budget planned out if you're going to go to war. Uh, if you deployed uh, long bowmen uh, instead of deploying men at arms or knights. Although I'd like to underline, during the Battle of Agincourt, knights and men at arms were both deployed from the in, in the English front. Okay, it's not a lot of people think that the Battle of Agincourt is the French had all cavalry and the um, and the English had all bowmen. But the reality is that the French had cavalry and only used the cavalry, although they also had crossbowmen, but they didn't use them for because they thought that they could completely destroy the um, English forces. But the things didn't really pan out that way. And on the other hand, the the English did have a lot of archers, and I think one of the reasons is this that they were cheaper to deploy than the others and the other kind of troops. But they also had there was a considerable number of men at arms and knights and if they hadn't been there uh, for example protecting the uh, the archers uh, etc the battle might have gone differently so it's not just archers loads of archers shooting okay there were also other troops but the reason why i say that it's good to deploy archers in that case instead of men at arms because archers they could they were multifunctional an archer can shoot a bow but he can also fight hand in hand and some of these archers were actually very well equipped some of which did have basically the same level of armor than a man at arm okay um because again they were professional soldiers they had been doing it for a very long time and some of them they were actually quite wealthy and they could buy not as wealthy as a knight of course but they could buy good armor at least in fact you do have archers during that battle with complete full plate legs breastplate, helmets, gauntlets as well, which of course they wouldn't wear while they operate the bow, but you know, if the troops are coming closer, um, you might as well, you know, just lose, remove the bow and wear the gauntlets, although please remember that that would only happen if the situation really gets to hand-to-hand -hand combat, because you can, and most of the times you will, shoot a bow point blank. In fact, that is exactly what a lot of archers were supposed to do, and that's what we see when, when we understand, when we look at medieval iconography, that archers mostly were used to maximize damage and in order to do that you needed to shoot the the opponent from from the closest distance possible because if you shoot from very far away and it, it doesn't work as well also because you can't be as precise and remember if you shoot a full plate French uh, a full plate armored French knight in the breastplate it's not gonna do anything even at point blank so never mind from distance and again the shooting on the air I've already been criticized a lot because I don't think it was done but I still defend my point and reiterate that I don't think it was done and most of the shooting would have been in you know towards the front if not looking down considering some fortification some hills um, and it, so the idea of now <clears throat> he, he does make a good point about the shooting um, and, and I did point out that that arrows are do have a cost um, yeah so arrows cost something and he does does make a point that the the shooting itself if you're shooting a charging army more than likely you're going to be shooting more straight ahead and you're going to probably only get one or two arrows loose before you're you know you're you're in a hand to hand combat situation unless you're up a hill and like you said you're shooting downwards 
they would uh, shoot upwards, and we do have documentation of that. They would shoot up in the air because, as I said, when you're you're not – this is not the movies. You're not pulling back a 100-pound drawstring bow or an 80-pound drawstring bow and holding it. You're pulling it up, and if you have a, a army on the other side of the field, you're letting gravity help you because what you're going to do – because gravity is going to take over as soon as you let go of that, of that arrow, and what's going to happen is – is going to start dropping. Now, obviously, at the speed it's going, it's not going to drop very quickly. But at the same time, when you shoot up in the air and the arrow kind of starts now taking this downward trajectory, it's going to really be even deadlier because now gravity is helping and taking over. So what uh, what they would do is they would shoot from the distance and shoot kind of an upwards and then let it come down. Um <clears throat> Again, this wasn't something that was done in every battle because not every battle had that opportunity. Um, you know, I think it happened more than probably what he's he's saying it is. But again, I wasn't there, so I don't know. It might not have. But there's also this whole idea of hey, these arrows cost us money, so let's not waste them. Yeah. Shoot them from shoot in the air and have the. Uh arrows rain uh, and shower your opponent is not uh, is not historical in my humble opinion i still defend that point because even if you look at the construction of some bassinets for example you see that they are optimized for um, arrows shooting direct shooting okay countering direct shooting and i was very happy to read to see i actually watched recently a video from scholar gladiatoria where both matt easton's and dr cap will um, discuss uh, the battle of agincourt and and I was very pleased to see that they were saying a lot of the things that I had said myself in another video beforehand um, where I sort of talk about uh, Lars Henderson and, and I mentioned this idea of I don't believe that you would actually shoot in the air but I think you should either point blank or anyways direct shooting and I was very pleased to see that they also said that because of course if Dr. Capwell said no the people the archers shoot in the air like this I'd be like okay sorry guys I'm wrong because I mean he's the you know but the fact that you know he came with he came to, I I should say I came to the same conclusion as the doctor really made me feel good about my point and I'm like right so it is like this most likely of course with history then you can't always you can you can never be hundred percent sure but considering the fact that iconography never shows the idea of shooting in the air considering the fact that it, it, it is mentioned that some of the knights in the french army they were shot in the face from point blank and therefore they actually were lowering their head and you don't lower your head if you're, you're if you're getting at you know if you're getting uh, arrows raining on you and, and also the idea of bassinets being exceptionally good at deflecting arrows that come from from either the french because of the muzzle that it has or the top because they are quite pointy it would make no sense to shoot like that I strongly uh, defend this point and even more so uh, after having seen that a one of the best um, incredible greatest experts on, on armor that I know and I also own his book and I think it's fantastic and I have a video review on the book from Dr. Capwell on the on armor English armor and you will find a link in the description below and then I even more so more fiercely defend this point so yes all of this to say knights were very uh, rich probably even more than we had considered all right noble but I hope that you enjoyed this video all right so he didn't get into a, into a lot of it. Yeah, he he did talk about the armor, um, and and as as he was talking, making some good points. You know, I, I did kind of look up a couple couple things. Uh, some of the dukes uh, who were who would we would consider to be, and I'm talking about like John of Gaunt, um, who obviously was a prince, and uh, but he was a, the Duke of Lancaster, uh, Dukes of Buckingham. These are the guys that we would consider to be the the billionaires, um, you know, like the Jeff Bezos type status. These guys were were making, and, and it, it does show you these guys were making roughly four to six thousand pounds a year in in that time period, which is the equivalent of about two point five million. And this is a year, so. That's what they're making in a year. Now, obviously, you know, our billionaires make more than that. But there's also, you got to also remember about the, as we go into the future, 
billionaire wages will increase. Let's not get into that topic. But it's it's still it, it's worth noting that. Um, the other the other thing that I, I found, like I said, the the laborers. I mean, we're talking about skilled laborers here. Uh, an armor would make around seventy three pences a week, seventy four pences a week. Um, and I guess in pounds, that's sixteen pounds a week. So that's just, that shows you that discrepancy there. This is a, a skilled armor. This is somebody who makes the armor for the guy making four thousand pounds a year, and that's on the low end. That four thousand, that two point five number, is on the low end. Um, Three point seven for the six thousand. So if he does well, he he does budget well, and he has a good season of of you know. Of fighting, and we say season for war because they typically didn't fight in the winter time. Um, and then you had to think about other, you know, other uh, considerations such as a horse. You need a horse. You need more than one horse, honestly. Um, you need your your what you call your your drought horse, which was your horse for for working your land, and this was just a strong horse. But then you also need your your palfrey, which would be the one that you would walk on or that would carry you places and then you needed a war horse so these are three different horses that are skilled differently your palfrey is your calmer your horse that you're you're traveling with it, it's it's made for walking long or it's bred for walking longer distances it's bred for for being able to handle your weight and and maybe some saddlebags at the same time of being able to to not exert too much force because you really didn't gallop or, or go anywhere very fast you just kind of trotted <clears throat> your like i said your your drought horse was definitely more of a workhorse and i don't have the cost of the palfrey but the the drought horse it looks around two 240 pence which i'm not sure what that would be in pounds i had to convert that but then you got your war horse which was about twenty thousand dollars so you're looking at a twenty thousand dollar horse and I can't even convert that. <laughs> um, or is that in pounds? No, maybe that is pounds. Uh, twenty thousand dollar. Anyway, twenty thousand dollar horse. Um, in the in the fifteenth century, and that's because it's trained to be a war horse. It's trained to handle loud noises. It's trained to kick the right people or the the right images that it's seeing. It's probably trained by color to see like. Okay, we we're the blue side, so you need you know for France, so you need to go kick the the red and yellow ones because they're English. Okay, um, it's trained to bite. Even it's trained to you know it's it's built to wear armor on itself. Um, even the gambeson that the the horse would wear, the gambeson like material is heavy. Plus, you're talking about a knight in full armor. Um, so yeah, you're 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 spending a, a lot of money for these horses. Now, if you take these horses to tournament, you could lose these horses. It's like, you know, basically, it's like racing for the pink slips. That's what a lot of them did. They would actually win the horses for the, from the, the knights they would defeat sometimes, uh, depending on the rules and regulations of the tournament. So you would, uh, and so now you'd have to almost break another horse in just to, to have that horse. But then, like I said, you would need, uh, you would need your regular horse, your pack horse, your or mule, depending on what you could afford, uh, and your war horse. You need all your gear, your armor. You probably want to have an armor on you. And I said, and as I said, that guy, that guy costs around. If you're looking at it in pounds a year, sixteen pounds a year. Uh, so you better win if you if you're in a castle and you you're the the manor lord or the duke. I mean, you're paying your your army. You know, you're paying your army like 18 pounds a year. And so this is all coming out of your way. So you need to make sure you're making wages. So, yeah, it was expensive being a, a knight or a nobleman in those days. Um, just the armor alone, you're looking at thousands of pounds. You're looking at thousands of pounds for your horses, for your for the wages for your men. And and we're not even talking about food yet. Uh, I haven't even talked about castles. I mean, like, like I said, a, a mason and a carpenter would make about five pounds a year um and you had to have a few of those if you wanted a castle so yeah you're definitely uh 
you're definitely looking at, at one of the reasons why they would raid, why a lot of, a lot of people would, would raid so much, uh, because it, it, it gave them, not only did it give them something to do, um, we do have kind of sources that said that the church created the, this class of knights, in a sense, to, to give them a, to get these raiders a better sense of who to raid. Like, hey, stop killing us and other Christians and go kill these other people and we'll sanction it and we'll give you gold for it. Um, but you also had to now figure out a way to pay for all these people that you've hired in the times that are that the church hasn't sanctioned war. So that will come into play a lot as well. And that's why we got tournaments uh, in one, one reason. So, yeah, it, it was expensive. All right, so thanks for watching. Uh, this has been Joseph S. San Diego. Uh, and, yeah, nice we're rich and we're not. So sucks to be us. Anyway, I'll see you next time. Take care.